Good morning. Today is July the 12th, 2021. My name is Frank Farmer, and we are here today as part of the Veterans History Project. Our guest today is Mr. Leonard Shaw. Mr. Shaw grew up in the area, graduated from a local high school, and then joined the Navy. And today's story is going to be about uh, his uh, tour of service in the United States Navy in the early 1960s a period of the Cold War when American and Russian submarines played a dangerous game of cat and mouse throughout the North Atlantic and in other oceans of the world. So, Mr. Shaw, thank you very much for being here today. Let me thank you in advance for your, for your service. Okay? Okay. All right. Uh, let's, let's start off. Tell us when you joined the Navy and why did you join the Navy? <laughs> I joined the Navy because my little brother talked me into it. <laughs> Well, okay. And that was in uh, August of uh, 1962. And where did you? Uh, uh, we went to. We went to. Chose to go to Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Station uh, for boot training. Did you know at that time that uh, you wanted to go into the submarine service? No, I never thought about it before. What made you think about it? Was that during your uh, boot training? Well, no. After we got out of boot camp, I was assigned. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to get the uh, uh, rating of uh, fire control technician, and that required a 24-week school, what they call A school, and that was at the Great Lakes uh, Training Center there. Uh, and so I got... I didn't get any money to go home on leave and come back. My brother did. He got transferred to uh, Aviation Ordnance in Jacksonville, and he got travel time of four days and money, and he waved by and got on the plane and left, and I got on the train and started home. <laughs> well, that was the end of that. So uh, while I was in A school training, the thresher went down, and uh, the it was uh, April, April of '63. Well, I had about six or eight more weeks of school to go, and uh, they were doing a submarine class on the base, hoping to get somebody to fall into their trap. <laughs> Now, this was a submarine service is an all volunteer service, correct? It, it is. It, and anytime you don't want to want it, you, you just non involve and you don't have to go back out to sea. They will make sure you don't. <laughs> well, the, the, they were given this submarine class, and everybody, this is two weeks after the thresher went down, and everybody wanted to know what happened to the thresher. Well, Naturally, if anybody knew anything, it was top classified. It wasn't, it wasn't common knowledge to anyone. Even Rickover didn't know back then. So uh, I, jo I joined, and they gave me an extra physical at, before I left Great Lakes. And they said, wow, your ears are not good. You will never stand a sonar watch. So I always remembered that. When I got to a submarine school in New London, Connecticut for six weeks, I got another physical. Same thing. You will never stand a sonar watch. Okay. Probably won't have to ever stand one. When I got out of my basic training at... Uh, or basic submarine training, uh, they sent me back to Great Lakes for another school in which uh, I'm at some of these same in school that the, the instructor had written me up for destruction of government property when I took a screw out of a trimmer capacitor that he said was defective, but 30 minutes before that, he said they never go bad. They've only got a little micro wafer and I pronounced it. It has no microwave or put the screw back in. Every command I went to, 
submarine school, back to my first submarine, then to my sev second submarine. Every command I went to, they took my service record out and read that. He wrote in there, in my service record, destruction of government property. He says, I did not like the Navy anymore. Not good. But you, uh, you did stay in the Navy. You served uh, in the submarine service, and you just, just told us that you had gone to, uh, was it New London for your submarine training? Yes. And how long was your submarine, uh, submarine training? Oh, actually waiting on the school, and when I got out of there, they gave me another little two-week school. But it was the actual studying part uh, class was five weeks, five or six weeks. Now, in that five or six weeks, you also uh, also uh, sharpened your skills with your MOS, your military occupation specialty. And what was your what was your MOS in the Navy? Well, I was a fire control technician, and on board ships, they control the radar, the guns, uh, the gun directors, and all the weapons. But on a submarine, we didn't have all that. We had mainly torpedoes and torpedo fire control equipment to uh, solve for the target, and uh, it was a lot different. But that was your job when you were assigned to that uh, to the to the submarines. Oh, fire... I was fine for it. Okay. There, there was only one thing wrong with it. There are no when you go up for the next uh, rank. There are no submarine questions. You have to answer questions that are primarily for destroyers, a particular type of destroyer. So we had to study the books. And but I, the, I went up, I took three tests, and I passed them all when I was in the Navy, and I got out as an E-5. All right. Now, you talked about uh, your, your service. We talked about your... Uh, uh, MOS, uh, but take us back to your physical. You said that you had uh, problems with ears, but that's a big thing on submarines because if a submarine ever gets caught or damaged, you have to egress. There's pressure changes, etc. So, what happened yeah. with your ears? They let well, you continue, apparently. Well, they just didn't hear good, and that's all I know about them. But I did go through the pressure changer chamber and twice and went through the blow and go tank where you get in the bottom and blow all the way to the top. That's about over 100 feet, I think, right at 100 feet. But I did the one in New London, Connecticut, and again, the one in uh, Pearl Harbor. And you passed those okay? Yeah. So your, your eardrums and your pressure changes uh, were all uh, in line with the standards of yep. uh, the submarine service, is that correct? All you, all you have to do is do what they tell you. <laughs> Blow as much as you can and just keep on going. Now, I assume that you never had to use that training for escaping from a disabled submarine. Is that correct? You better believe it. Okay. Now, you mentioned the, uh, the Thresher. That was, if I remember, the Thresher was a, the first nuclear-powered submarine to, to go down. And you mentioned that for a yes. long time they they didn't know the re did they ever find the reason for that, as far as you know for the threshold? There were several reasons. First of all, th this is published. It they it was classified for years. They never they have never released all the information. There's several thousand pages, several hundred thousand pages left that they will not produce, uh, will not turn loose of. But uh, for one thing, they just come out of the yards, so that uh, for a lot of overhauls and, 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 and they, they um, were to go to test depth, which they had changed the test depth from almost twice what they were before. Uh, now, for similar me, submarines. What is the test depth? What is that? Test depth is, uh, this would be almost 
close to 50% of your crush depth. All right, so it's it's yeah. safe, but it's getting near the point where well, you don't want to yeah. keep going down, correct? Well, you assume that everything is in perfect condition. <laughs> All right. But well, the, well, what really happened was uh, they went and below below down to t down and they gave their report several times going down and i think it was about 700 feet that they called and said they were going on down and their test depth they had set for them to be 1300 feet there was a a pipe in the engine room they call it the engine room, I think, where the reactor is and everything, that started that they sprung a leak. And as they were trying to stop the leak, they had called and told them they had a leak leak in the engine room and it was shortly after that. Now, keep in mind the reactor this point they were right at test depth, thirteen hundred feet. No room to play with. Evidently, the water got in some of their electronics and shut the reactor down. So they had no propulsion except what was on what what was in in their batteries, which were only made to, for about two knots, two to three knots on that submarine is. That's not fast enough to give you any lift from your planes. They call them the fair water planes up in the cell. And uh, it's just like a rudder or anything. You, you need speed. And uh, so they lost the reactor and started blowing the main ballast tanks. However, they had put modified the blow lines to have strainers in them. The strainers from the te temperature of the the air changing from the uh, from the uh, big cylinders they were uh, had the air, air compressed air at 4,500 psi going out at a at a much less pressure caused condensation in the air lines condensation and possibly the strainers added to it and the condensation turned it turned into ice and the ice they they blew and uh being being once the reactor goes down it's a um, seven minutes minimum till they can get it back up they just didn't have the time they started blowing the blow system was not at that depth for that amount of water that was flooded in there. It was just too much for them to get any lift on at that low of speed. And every safety feature that they had overrode the other one. They had three major things happen at one time. They heard on the, uh, on the uh, sonar, uh, passive sonar, they heard air when when they keyed the mic and were trying to talk. They they could hear air, so it may have been a ruptured air line also. But anyway, their their blow system was not up to speed. So the entire crew was was lost uh, as as a result of that. And sixteen yard people. These are uh, the shipyards. These are. Civilian, or some case, civilian workers and military they, workers. Anytime you go in the yards and you've done hole, hole modifications or any welding on the hull, they always take a handful of shipyard people because, for one thing, you can't get anybody that's more knowledgeable about it, about all the change up that's been made. And uh, besides, in case somebody happens to be a spy. They might do some uh, defective work. <laughs> I, I guess that would deter a, a spy if you're That's going to go right. on the uh, the ship. That so you're... you don't know who they're going to pick. They don't let you know who they're going to pick till they get ready to get underway. And 
but in this case, 16, 16 shipyard 16 extra, yeah, were, civilians. Were on and that's probably why they have released the information they have on the thresher going down. Now, this occurred, this occurred just before you went into the... Two weeks, two weeks about before. two or three weeks. So surely that must have been on your mind, or was it not? Did you, you were young, and I guess uh, you felt well, like... Well, it didn't bother me. Well, that's, well tell me, I've, I've heard stories about uh, submarines when, when you get down and, and you talked about crush depth, and I assume that's the, that's the depth that the, the weight of the ocean is going to crush the submarine. Yep. I've heard stories about submarines you can, when it's on the surface, you can take a uh, rope and tie it from one side to the other side, get it very taut, and as you descend down into the, into the depths of the ocean, the pressure begins to compress uh, the submarine. So when you get down real low, that taut rope is a very, very limp rope as the, uh, is, is that correct? Yes, that happens. Well, did you serve? Did you serve on uh, nuclear uh, or uh, diesel submarines, or do you, or on both? I was on two different diesel submarines. One that was in actually in World War II, and the war ended right then. And while they were going back for fuel, they got a small drop bomb or something dropped on the superstructure there, and it blew up part of their. Uh, but that didn't stop them from getting back to Fremantle, uh, Australia to get their work done. So this was a World War II diesel submarine. This was the first submarine you served on. Yes, sir. Now, test depth, if you want to really know, 412 feet. As opposed to the test depth of the newer Th submarines. Uh, yeah, 1,300 feet. So there's a... Well, there were also World War II boats towards the end of the war. They were getting a little short on metal, and they cut them back to, to a thinner hole, and the test depth on them was 312 feet. So they couldn't go very far down to try to escape. Not uh, very much further than the periscope depth. <laughs> well, a little, a little later on in the interview, we're going to talk about life on a... Uh, a diesel submarine, because as I understand it, it's uh, it's pretty close cramp quarters. But I said that'll be a little later on in the uh, interview. Can you tell us the names of? You said you served on two submarines. Tell us the names of those two submarines. Can what, you do that? What would you like to know about them? Just the names, the names of the submarines you were. Okay, on. the USS Barbaro was uh, SSG three one seven. G was for guided missile submarine, and uh, believe it or not, when I got my orders, I didn't even know what the G was for. <laughs> Till I got there and I saw that missile hanger, and my first question is, what's that? <laughs> oh, well, that was that. And uh, that was the uh, old World War II submarine. And there were five of them in Pearl Harbor. There was another World War II one that was a, uh, mm, I can't think of the name of it right now. Anyhow, there they were, there was two of them that were made regular submarines, and they had two large missile hangers down in the front of the, front of the submarine going down, and they carried two missiles in each, each one of those missile silos that was a grayback and the growler and then there was a halibut which had five missiles in it now later later on you, I'm going to talk about the, the hatches or all the largest hatches is all the hatches are the same size at 21 inches getting up and down out of the submarines on uh, up on the top of the deck and furthermore and the halibut had one 22 feet wide 22 feet they called it a hatch because because they used it later on when they refurbed it and uh, did a little 
spying. <laughs> Putting it mildly. So the, but the, uh, the other sub the other submarine was a tunny that was it was our sister ship because they were like us. They were old and had been retrofitted real quick while they were building the the other submarines because they had these regulus missiles they wanted to use as a deterrent patrols. So that was the uh, next question. What was the, the what was your main mission of your of your submarine? The main mission was to leave Pearl Harbor, go to Midway Island, top off in fuel, 120,000 gallons, get, get any uh, supplies that they had in the, in the order of, we'd already taken on all our stores at Pearl Harbor, and that was only seven days later. We took their fresh milk, uh, any uh, vegetables and fruits fresh that they had, and headed north, east, northwest. And what was northwest? Northwest. Now this is, there's only one time that I went on this patrol and this was the last deterrent patrol they made. And the mission, the entire mission was to stay undetected, get to your point of where they assigned you and Ha make sure your missiles and fire control equipment was ready to let turn loose those missiles. Now the uh, we had to surface to launch. Uh, that was going to be my next question. Uh, so these missiles were designed to uh, hit uh, <laughs> ships, uh, cities, uh, military installations, etc. That I assume because that well, correct? they were designed by the Germans. It's a old U-2 missiles, missile that V-2, V-2 missile that the Germans had that they were, they shot several of them over to London and at the end of the war, they were trying, trying to get, get the program going and the war ended before they could and everybody was thankful of that. Now what were the, uh, what, as a member of the crew, what, what were the crews uh, told about the Russians? Uh, what, what did you... About the Russians? We didn't. Only the officers, two spooks. Uh, explain, and, explain to the audience what, what well, the term spooks. spooks. The two spooks that we, uh, I assume that they use on every run, maybe different ones, but anyway, they are... I think they speak Russian fluently and whatever, but they didn't do much conversation with the crew. They stayed in that radio shack I'm practically all the time, both of them. And uh, no, they, we didn't know anything about them and they didn't know anything. Uh, they knew everything about us. But. The only reason I ever learned where we were was a friend of mine. They they were doing some plot. We were going to simulate uh, shooting a missile in, uh, and he went down in. They needed him badly. Somebody that didn't have a watch station at battle station, and uh, he went down and helped them do some plotting. And he didn't tell me till we got back to Pearl Harbor where we were but we were inside the coast of Russia in the Sea of uh, Okhotsk. It's 900, it's around 900 miles long. And uh, that's in uh, Russian territorial waters? What? Well, Russian waters, yeah. Well, it was, I, at least I didn't know where we were, but I had it figured out because the water was uh, so smooth, I mean, it wasn't like being out in the middle of the ocean trying to snorkel where you can't maintain your depth with it for the waves and everything. The, the, it was pretty smooth and really cold. I mean, the uh, down the side of the submarine was just continuously condensation. We are continuously pumped into bilges and to get rid of the condensation. Were the crews ever told uh, where you were, or were or they ever warned that hey, we're 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 in close well, proximity to Russians, so actually, be quiet. 
actually, I don't think anybody ever asked. I had no idea where we were. Throughout the and, whole throughout the whole cruise, yes, until until we almost got hit one night, and, and then it become a little bit scary. Well, tell, tell us about that night and what happened. Oh, well, that particular night we were up after dark, go up, start snorkeling, and start charging the batteries, and I'm in the amidships in the control room, and and I have I'm in operating the trim manifold to trim the submarine up one one end by pumping water from one end to the other under the uh, officer, or officer of the decks, uh, diving officer who's standing behind me and right beside me is the bow planes, the stern planes, and uh, we're maintaining, maintaining the depth of the ship and all of a sudden the sonarman ca calls and says uh, t had, had a warship he classified it as a warship and it was coming in our direction so they secured snorkeling right away pulled periscopes down everything started to get quiet they shut the engines down shut them off and uh we just sit there quiet sinking a little bit maintaining minimum turns which only put us at about probably two knots, but where everything's quiet. Then they went to sonar quiet. They shut down the 60 cycle, motor generators, air conditioning, everything, everything on the submarine was turned off. They turned on DC lighting, which is very, very dim, coming straight from the batteries. And uh, that's all we had. You could have heard a pin drop. And all of a sudden, and they said, they kept calling sonar and asking them, and they said, was it a, did they think it was a submarine or a surface craft? They don't, can't tell, but it's got the screw beat. It is, it is nothing but a warship. And the submarines use about the same uh, screw, screw beat per knot as, as the uh, surface, uh, surface warship, so. Come on, no, it's still coming straight towards us. Well, I can only imagine that it probably was a destroyer or something, and they probably got radar blips from our our uh, our snorkel intake, which is probably about 18 inches, and that's probably and it's like a big brown bubble, and and. Uh, I'm sure they picked it up on the surface craft and came in that direction and then didn't see anything. They just kept on going. But there no active uh, pinging that you would think it would be in, in a surface craft. And I was sitting right there on that trim manifold and it come at an angle to us and I, I just felt I could reach out and touch it. It, it was that loud making no, the, wa the water noise that it was making, the cavitation. And I just took a deep breath, never said a word, and nobody on board said a word. And before long, it's, it's periscope depth, prepare to snorkel, two main engines. And so you're, you're back to your regular mission <laughs> after that. And you all were. That's you, right. Uh, you never got the crew never got notified about what occurred or any of that. Correct. We had no idea, but all uh, I'm sure everybody thought the same thing. If it's a submerged submarine, I hope it's not submerged at the same depth we are. But that was it. After it was over, that was it. Nobody, nobody quit the submarine when we got back to ta back to the Pearl Harbor later. But well, I assume that as a submarine crew and, and the missions you were on, and uh, that your crew was probably ordered uh, never to speak about anything after you got off that submarine. Is that I assume nobody that. ever spoke about it. Period. It that was it just ended. It happened and it ended. Well, let me ask you a couple other questions about. You know, I'm sure the audience uh, is, is curious about how life, I mean, what we, what we consider everyday life on a submarine is like. So first of all, tell us, 
approximately how long was your submarine and what was the number of crew members of your submarine? It, it was within a foot or two. It was 320 feet long. And because it had that missile hanger on the top, it was top heavy and it rocked badly. They put an extra keel underneath the, I mean, welded on an extra keel and they filled it full of big lead weights. I think they weighed 60 pounds or so each. And by the way, when they decommissioned the submarine, they put it in a dry docks, cut all, cut holes in the hull or, or in the uh, in the keel, and we had to remove every one of them. And there was thousands of them. Days. And your uh, uh, crew members? What was the approximate number of crew members or men who would be on that uh, submarine? I th we had because we had a missile crew. But we only had one engine room. Uh, there, there was right at probably about a hundred, about about ninety, ninety, and about ten ten officers. It was about ninety to about a hundred. So yeah, around a hundred uh, human beings on the submarine. Did you have any uh, uh, shower accommodations? Well, yeah, there were showers there. They just never got used. <laughs> Did I, 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 I? Let me tell you this. On there, we can only make, we got two distilling units. We can only make 42 gallons an hour. That is, at the first of the week. When we light them off, by the end of the first week, they are so corroded in the tubes uh, that, uh, or in the in oh they they go from the bottom to the top of the uh, distilling unit and we start out making 42 gallons an hour and by the end of the week it's down to in the 20s in other words about doesn't pay to we get more heat out of it than we get water so they turn Bring the, bring the one up that they've rebuilt, done rotted, the, took it all apart and rotted all the tubes out. They, they took, put it on the line. When it makes 42 gallons in one hour, they, they turn the other one out and turn right around and start rebuilding it. Now, make, making only 42 gallons of water at the maximum per hour, you've got a crew of 100. Were you ever on, uh, uh, was our water rations, or where the water was rationed? Did you get no. to that point? No. So you yeah. had you had plenty of drinking water. What was your? Uh, when I was on watch, I can't tell you how many times <coughs> the auxiliaryman on the watch would call the control room and tell me all the fresh water tanks are full. I need need permission to dr drain it into the bills, pump it into the bills, forty two gallons. That was it, huh? The uh, what were your duty hours? How I mean, you when you're underwater, it's kind of hard to keep track of what's daylight and what's uh, night. But how are your duty or, uh, hours uh, allotted on a submarine? Well, if you want to know, if you want to know what time of day it is, you go to the mess hall, and if they're serving bacon and eggs, uh, it's morning. They serve they serve a meal every four hours at sea. The meal is for the for the uh, the the. It's usually assumed that they have three crews, three complete crews that take care of the submarine, and the, the crew going on, they eat and go. They got first first. First call, uh, how it, dinner's now being served in the cruise dinette. Yeah, that's the way we used to pass the word or meal. But anyway, the people going on, on watch would, would eat first, relieve the people on watch. They would eat second, and then anybody else that wanted to eat third. Now, you said you were on uh, uh, 
essentially 18 hour duty days, six hours on duty, six hours sleeping, and four hours. Was that was that about yeah. the way it was divided four, up? Four. And you talked about the food. How how was the food on the submarine? Was it was it? Do you have enough uh, fresh food, or how, how was the food? The food was the best you could get. Now, when we got after we were at sea for over two weeks, uh, you didn't have any fresh vegetables or nothing. We m mainly had can uh, one gallon cans of lima beans, corn, or whatever. But you, but you never went hungry. You never had to eat uh, no other things. Uh, no, we did. We did okay. Now I was going to ask you: You ever have a close encounter with the Russian submarines? You've already described that you had a close encounter with something, whether or not it was a submarine or a destroyer. It was probably a destroyer that picked us up on radar and ran over there. It went straight as a as from the first time they picked it up. It came straight over the top of us. So I, I assume it, they had picked us up on radar. Now, how was your sleeping arrangements on a submarine? I understand that the old diesel submarines uh, were pretty confined in space. Uh, so how did they arrange the sleeping accommodations for the crew? Well, well my, my bunk, I couldn't even roll over in it. I had to slide out and, and flip, my, flip my shoulders over. <coughs> Excuse me. Ship flip my shoulders over and slide back in so but we all had our own rack uh, there years ago there was hot bunking where they didn't have enough but we had a big stern room a uh, forward torpedo room where where the crew slept the forward battery was officers sonar radio and the chief's quarters now you mentioned hot bunks for the for the audience. Explain what hot bunks uh, mean, please. Hot bunking was when they had more crew than they had bunks, and uh, the the person getting out of the rack and going relieving it, and the guy that he relieves come back and take his bunk, and that's the way they did it. So he had two or more people sharing one bunk. Is that essentially? Yes, or or three people sharing two bunks or something. I think we did some hot bunking one time under, but only for a few days. Did your uh, submarine, you've already told about a uh, close encounter with some, some ship of some type. Did you ever have, uh, your submarine ever have an engine failure when, or, uh, when diving or a emergency uh, uh, in that, in that kind of well, situation? Now, we never had any emergencies on my first submarine. The second submarine I was on, every time you turn around, they had emergency. Flooding here, fire here. In fact, when I got on the second submarine, I asked them, I said, do, do they, do y'all have uh, drills on here, you know, for flooding or something? He said, we don't need it. We have the real thing all the time. <laughs> the first submarine I was on, when we were in port, it, we would do, we, the duty section on board at night would do a drill of some kind occasionally. But we never did any drills. But you never had a, uh, uh, you never had a life-threatening uh, or... Life-threatening? No. But you mean beside the near collision? Yes. Yeah. Well, tell us about that. On board, we started, uh, for some reason, just out of nowhere, they decided we're going to do some hovering. Hovering means you shut your engines off or you, you, you don't use, uh, you're on the battery, okay? And you just shut the screws down. And you, what you do is you watch this bathythermiograph, which is in the overhead right above the diving officer, and he looks for a layer of water that is different. Uh, sometimes it's maybe warmer or colder, 
or it may be a, a big rain has gone by and dropped a lot of fresh water, but it's, it has different buoyancy, different layers of water, and they hunt for these. We, we did, and uh, we found them, and we practiced. We would uh, be at periscope depth, and uh, we, the diving officer would start flooding, flooding the tank, and we it start going down, and he'd say, "Secure the flooding." This was on the trim manifold here, trim manifold. Okay, secure flooding, and we would keep going down and keep going down, and then he would say, "Okay, start pumping, pumping that water back out," and uh, we would pump the water out, and the submarine, being heavy like it is, would continue going down, maybe down to 120 or 160 feet, and it starts slowing down. Slowing down. As soon as it started back up, he started said, "Start flooding that water back in slowly, or pumping it in." And we would hover between the two layers of, of uh, that they found on the Bathy thermograph, either one layer or two layers, and that we could do this forever, without, without any uh, propulsion. I assume now, this was a this was a now, way of detecting. Okay. Being uh, or, or, or to avoid being detected by other. Oh yeah, we're not going to surface. <laughs> they'd probably take it down to the bottom before they'd surface. <clears throat> but what 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 I found out for after two or three days of practicing this, guess what? Got up one morning, got on watch. Said they are going to go into the cubicle. The cubicle connects your generators, main motors, and batteries. Everything goes, it's just got huge shifts. It's got large uh, connections, co connections in there. And they had some of these contacts. They were silver or silver plated. Anyway, had gotten worn. Said, so we're going to disconnect. The whole, from the battery and from everything, no propulsion possible. We'll put a man in there where there's no no power in there. Put a man in there, and he's going to replace some contacts. So, that's the story of it. It it took probably two hours that we went without any propulsion. They had faith enough, and there ain't no way we could have got the power back on if something would have happened. We could have blown the ballast tanks and surfaced, yes. But that's it. So you were pretty vulnerable during those uh, during those two hours. Yeah. I even said right there with a the diving officer over my head that huh, if we had more in contact, seems like that when we were in Pearl was a good time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably the rest of the crew agreed with you on that. Uh... Nobody said. He didn't say a word. Well, tell me, what was the length of a typical cruise for your submarine when you went out, when you left? Uh... Oh, since I only went on that, on its last trip before we sank it, I think that was, it's on that piece of paper I had there, I think, I think it was close to 68 or 70 days or something like that. It was not a long one, but it was, as, as uh, the new, Polaris submarines were getting on station. They were replacing us as, as the deterrent patrols, which is all we ever did, strictly deterrent patrols. Stay submerged, and stay, stay quiet, and stay out of everybody's way. And be ready to fire them missiles when you get on station. Well, you say deterrent patrols, so the Russians knew that uh, that you and the other submarines were out there somewhere ready to fire the missiles if they oh, were to no, take no, any. Oh, no, 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 Not that I know of. Well, the reason I bring that up is the deterrence, the deterrence to the Russians is that they knew that there would be a response from the Americans if they initiated any, any particular action. And the, uh, the submarines you were on, I assume, carrying the missiles were were capable of having that response. I never thought about any of that. 
nobody ever talked about anything. Well, I guess that's a... That's why they call it the silent service. <laughs> now, what ports did you go into? Uh, what, what were your places that you're... You mentioned Pearl Harbor and you mentioned Midway. There's only one port we ever went into, and that was Midway, going and coming... So that was that was where you left from, stayed. So you didn't have any exotic uh, ports to visit uh, around the world, any other locations? No. Nope. That was it? No. Nope. We were not allowed to go into... The, the word was that one of the submarines had went into... Years ago, when they first started the program, had went into Japan uh, and uh, they kind of questioned them on the missile hangar, and I asked them not to come back. <laughs> they, I, I don't know why they were so touchy about a nuclear bomb. Japan, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, I guess we can understand. I guess we can understand that. How long did you serve in the Navy? Four years and two months. And you've already told us your rank, you were an E-5, is that e correct? When you, E-5. When you got out? Fire control. FTG2SS. Now, I was going to ask you uh, the next question, but it's kind of answered by the emblem that you have on the front of your hat there, uh, uh, the, t the twin dolphins. Yes, I have my dolphins there. And tell, they, us what that, that, tell us what that signifies, please. That signifies that I worked my ass off to, to get them because I was on that submarine and I had to do stand watches every day, and I had to work with a torpedo woman on every Monday when they rotated the torpedoes and grease the gyros. And uh, I had a minimum amount of time. They no you normally get a week. They give you a week or more for each system to be qualified on on a submarine a week to two weeks and we as soon as we got back they decommissioned the submarine because we'd been replaced by the uh polaris and uh everything was push and go and we didn't even know it and it happened so fast and they were transferring people out of there and i got kind of sidelined there and said, they haven't called me up. To, uh, they, finally, they asked me, did I want to stay there and be on that submarine until they, and they were going to have a crew of about 15 people to get it underway, and they were going to shoot torpedoes at it and then sink it. Now, when you went through the submarine service, uh, the schooling for it, when you finished that schooling, People are not qualified to wear the, the twin dolphins. It's only after you have been on a submarine for a period of time and have, have answered all the questions about the various systems that you become qualified at, to wear the twin dolphins and to be a, a qualified submariner. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, normal thing is when you get your qualification sheet, you, you have many systems on there, and you don't have to go in order, but we always started out with the, the tanks and, and all this, and every tank on there, you had to know where it was, what it was, how they transferred uh, whatever it was that tank held, whatever, how you transferred it, either by air or by pump, how much, it, how many gallons it held, just like the submarine held roughly, I'm telling you closely, to 120,000 gallons of uh, fuel. Okay, it had main ballast tanks, it had uh, sanitary tank, uh, negative tank, uh, it had fuel ballast tanks, main ballast tanks, uh, and it had a collection and a um, So you had you had to pass each one of these various 
Yes. Specialties on the submarine. Yes. There was there was uh, the the uh, communication systems. Uh, there was a uh, propulsion systems, the engines, uh, the torpedo room. Each room you had to stand a watch in, and you. You, you, there was nothing that you didn't know about that submarine when you got through. First thing was, when I was on the first submarine, up in the conning tower on the way to the bridge from down in the control room, there was a, there was a uh, sound-powered headset there, and there was a switch on it. There was 14, 14 stations that you could communicate with. And they would call down and tell, call, call the control room or call the forward battery. You had to know which one it was in the dark, because you didn't have any light hardly in the conning tower, because they went through there to go on the bridge where it's dark. So in the daytime only would you have a little bit of light. You had to know where they were on that dial to go to one of them 14 stations. Lucky enough, there's four. Eight, twelve, and if you went to any one of those positions, you could go one below or above, and that was a way. But you had to remember which each one was. <laughs> I, I had a terrible memory. <laughs> now, everybody that uh, served on a submarine did not pass those qualifications, I assume. Well, they give you a chance to go through it again, but the only people that had problems was people that spent too much time downtown or whatever if you if you worked every now and then living at the sub base when we were in port we'd go up to the sub base instead of being on the submarine all the time i would go down during the week and uh get with the crews that was on the duty down there and get have them take me through something and answer all the questions because they will take you down to the bilges down there and says Okay, that is our compressor. There's two of them. They, they, that's where we get our high pressure air, four stage compressor. The first stage goes up to, I think it was 150 pounds. The second stage went up to over 600. The third stage was something like over 1200 to 1400. And the third, the final stage, the fourth stage, went up to 3,100 pounds. And that's how we got our high pressure air. So uh, when you were in the Navy, the, the father of, generally considered the father of the nuclear Navy, the United States Navy, was Admiral Rickover. Was, was, Hyman he, Rickover. So you knew, did he ever come to your ship or? I didn't you? know him personally. I never saw him the whole time I was in the Navy. But what do you what do you think about uh, him and his ideas and the uh, what resulted in the uh, nuclear submarine fleet? Well, I'm reading a book right now, and it's got a lot about him in there, and uh, I'd just rather not say anything. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> okay. Blind man's bluff. All right. Well, that's a that's a a. a a clue for the uh, for the audience then for Blind Man's Bluff. Blind Man's Bluff. Read it. Now, as we near the end of the uh, interview, Mr. Shaw, is there anything else you'd like to uh, bring up about uh, the submarine service and in your service uh, as we as we come to the end? Well, I can tell you one other incident that slightly disturbed me. We were out on a patrol, and as you common before anytime anytime we go out a port leave port every day the any stores or torpedoes that are taken on that varies the weight of the fuel and anything that's put on board that's going to vary the weight of the submarine they correct for it they flood water in uh, to balance it up and everything so when you leave port, 
your first dive is what they call a trim dive. If you're going to have an exercise, you certainly want, don't want to be down there fighting fighting the damn submarine going in the wrong dire direction towards the bottom and because it's got too many torpedoes up front. I know this for a fact. Anyway, you want to do your trim dive, and you always do it at full speed. You're not trying to save the batteries, the engines, or nothing. You scur the engines. So you're ready to dive. Dive at full speed. That way, your planes have plenty of, if you're too heavy, the planes can hold you up until you can blow tanks or whatever. But you want to get it at periscope depth and get that submarine where it's perfectly level, where your planes are level when when you're going. If 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 you've got too much rise on one plane, uh, the bow planes, then it's because you're too heavy up for, front, and it's trying to hold it up. So you shift some weight from the front to the from the from the front to the back with through the trim manifold, a couple of thousand pounds of uh, water. Now I can tell you more about this trim dive. This is the second submarine I was on. I happen to be the captain's right-hand man, being the uh, lead fire control technician, and my my position there during uh, coming in port and going out of port is on is right up there behind the captain and the uh, conning officer. And uh, I give all the uh, bells and and and, and uh, orders for the for the bridge. I'm the bridge phone talker. And once it, once I get out to sea, naturally I go down and hit the skid because probably been up on watch that night because the watch the team that has a watch that's been there all night they're the ones that get the submarine underway along with other people. So I go back to my rack, and my rack is in the front end, towards the front end. There's a temporary bulkhead there, or a bulk, it's, it's permanent, but it, it's not watertight or anything. It's just a big aluminum stanchions and all this at the foot of my rack. Stern room. We do our trim dive, and all of a sudden, wow. I am, well, we are really going down. I mean, they have taken it down, and the submarine is going down worse like this. I have no idea what depth we're at, but I am standing on that, my feet on that bulkhead. We're, it's approaching 45 degrees. Well, when, it, when, you're, when you get to that depth and you try to blow the tanks, the air will just go on out the tank. You gotta have, to blow that water out, you gotta blow it out the bottom. Well, maneuvering room's right ahead of us and they throwed the hatches on the latches uh, to, to lock them, uh, to catch them and hold, hold the door. So you can get it dog shut if you have to. And I could hear the, the screws right underneath and it, went there and started backing it stopped and started backing up well backing up with all that weight on the front end you're not going to back up the front end is going down 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 well all of a sudden i didn't know what happened but all of a sudden the screws stopped and they went all ahead forward <laughs> i mean emergency flank speed and uh, we, went, we took a long dive and kept, finally came out of it. And I was told that the captain, when, the, when they got too big an angle on the submarine, the captain jumped through there and put full, full rise on the bow planes and went all ahead emergency to get that angle off. And what happened was, the officer, we we had taken on something like uh, it was over ten large, uh, large, four, fourteen uh, Mark fourteen torpedoes, the old same 
torpedo used in World War II, but they weighed close to 3,000 pounds each. We had all that weight in the forward torpedo room, and it was like, we also had some 37 zeros and 37 ones, which were homing torpedoes and wire guided homing torpedoes. But these, we were so many thousand pounds heavy, and evidently the, the, the officer that was in charge that day did not compensate for them. And no, I guess none of the other officers, for one time, nobody thought to check it, double check it and we like to lost it. And once again, nobody said a word. We got back in there and I think I was the only one that said, wow, I'm sure glad somebody got this thing going in the right direction. And, and some one of my buddies that was in the control room, uh, the attack center, he says, oh yeah, the captain jumped through the hatch and said he assumed, he assumed command and away we went. He turned everything around quick. He knew what to do. Well, that sounds like that was uh, a close call. And it sounds like you had, uh, in your stint in the silent service, you had many uh, or several close calls. Uh, Mr. Shaw, I want to thank you today for taking the time for coming and telling your story, which is a fascinating story about service uh, in the uh, submarine uh, uh, service. I want to thank you for your service, and uh, thank you for taking the time again to come. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Let me tell you, this right here, that one deterrent patrol got me into VFW. <laughs> right. And yeah. I'm a veteran. Very good. Very good. This is a project authorized by Congress and administered by the Library of Congress. The objective is to interview as many as possible of those veterans from World War II to the present. The Library of Congress then archives these videos, keeps them on records to make them available to the public both in person and online. The library also encourages local venues such as historical societies and museums, like the one we're in at the present time, the New Smyrna Museum of History, to keep these videos and make them available to the local population.